Our guest today has an extensive writing resume for both the screen and the comic book page. Uh, his credits include multiple episodes of Supernatural, as well as more than 30 issues of the Flash ongoing comic book series for DC. He's currently the author of Green Lantern for DC, and I'm really anxious to ask him about Omega Bam Man. Jeremy Adams, thank you for joining us, sir. Yes, I'm so glad to be here. Great to have you. Great to have you. Okay, so talk to me about how the Green Lantern gig comes about. Because as, as you've done a bunch of work for DC, you did, you worked on, I think, Flashpoint Beyond. You did, yeah. you did 30 issues of the Flash series itself. Yeah. How do you get Green Lantern? I think, I think it was to make me feel less sad about taking me off the flash. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so the, the day that they told me that, hey, uh, we're taking you off the flash. We want to go in a different tonal direction. I was like, oh, what about the kids? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but, but we want you to do Green Lantern. And I was just like, I don't know. I, I, was, I, I was all just like, I don't know. I, you know, and I, I called well, you a because you got to introduce, uh, was it Wade uh, while yeah, signed? Wade, Wade yeah, Wade West after Mark Wade, and um, and I I really obviously gotten probably too close to those characters, <laughs> and I was just having a great time writing the Flash, and it was doing well, and so um, but they wanted to go in a different direction, so they said, hey, uh, but we'd like you to do Green Lantern, and I literally was just like, well, let me think about it. <laughs> Like you need to think about it. And I called uh, Jeff Johns and he was like, they took you off the flash. I don't understand. And then go, yeah, they want me to do green lantern. He's like, what? Well, <laughs> he's like, this is great. This is fantastic. And I was like, well, if you get the seal of approval from Jeff, that was a little, that went a long way to kind of like make me feel more comfortable. But I was terrified taking over green lantern, absolutely terrified. And still to this day, I think anytime I write a comic book and I send it out into the world, I'm always a little, you know nervous about well where does people... that where does that intimidation for green lantern come from i mean is it because the universe is so expansive i mean yeah. i was gonna ask you do you have to do any prep for uh, for green I lantern think, i think literally it's you know listen i'm a writer so the amount of like uh self-doubt that i have is is massive and it's with anything i do but green lantern in particular you know jeff had uh expanded the universe so widely with all the emotional spectrums and stuff like that and trying to figure right, out because he'd been he'd been on the book from like i think it was 2004 through 2000 like the the yeah, early crazy. 2010s crazy to get yeah, he had how much he's been on that book i did a signing with him and mark wade and it was like people brought in trolley carts of omnibuses mm -hmm. for him and then they would like give me one you know uh but yeah it, it was hard it was intimidating because it, it, like any fandom you step into i try to be do my due diligence and and know as much as I do. Now, it's kind of a, a circle for me because my first credit in television was a Green Lantern, the animated series. So it's not like I was unfamiliar with Green Lantern. It was just, how do I tell a different story or how do I tell a story that people will be engaged with? And and that's always, you know, nerve wracking. And, you know, as a fan, as a nerd, um, you know, fandom can be very wonderful and it cannot be wonderful. So you never oh. know which side you're going to get. And I I try to be just very positive and 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 always just extol the positive and kind of ignore the negative which there is always negative you know so i mean with with the with i guess a little bit of the jitters in mind how did you develop the story and 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 what is the story for uh for your run because you got a, a you're starting yeah. on a new volume of green lantern with number one uh, yeah. at the time of this recording issue 11 just came out right so you're you're pretty deep into it so how did you develop the story then so my brain uh, tends to generate a ton of ideas. And what had happened was Paul, my editor, was like, hey, we'd like it to be a little more earthbound. Well, I had I had during when I first started in comics, which was like two years prior, maybe because I haven't been in comics that long. I had pitched something right. similar or something similar in terms of like I would really like to make Hal uh, earthbound. And I had come up with this whole quarantine and different things. So by the time they offered me the job, and it was two days before Christmas. We were driving up to my in-laws. And then that three-hour ride, my brain was just moving. Oh, wow. And so by the time I got there, I was like, oh, I know what this is. And, uh, you know, called them back and said, yeah, this is what I'd love to do. And they they all seemed to respond to it, especially the starting out with Hal on Earth and keep it more kind of character focused and seeing who this poor schlub is and getting him back into his life and Carol being, you know, engaged and all of that stuff. Because definitely I found when you start writing Hal, the stars are calling 
And it's like everything in that book wants you to go to space. And so it was definitely a task mm -hmm. to try to keep him on Earth. Now, I mean, Hal Jordan, he's, when we talk about Green Lantern, there, there's at least half a dozen right. Earth-bound Green Lantern characters. Right. Like, title characters who've had their own books. I think there's, I think there's almost one to correspond with every decade that Green Lantern has been around. <laughs> Probably true. But I mean, with with how it always seems i guess to come back to hal jordan yeah like it was it wasn't a surprise that they that you know you've got a hal jordan book here right what is it do you think about hal jordan that makes him i guess the flagship green lantern for lack of a better term that's a good question i think it's because he's the first one in the green lantern core that w was mm -hmm. written about and i think there's right. a i mean there's a huge you know depth of story that has gone on prior to this with uh hal jordan um and definitely probably more serialized than maybe alan scott was prior to that uh, right but i also tend to think it's the same thing when i was writing wally i tend to think that the prior stories influence the current ones in terms of seeing the width and depth of this character a character that has lost so much and gained so much and the willpower to continue to move on I mean, Hal is really interesting to me in terms of what they did to him in terms of the parallax possession and then the coming mm -hmm. back and him being Spectre and all of that was really interesting to me. And he's this, you know, uh, he's a product of an older age. He's, he, you know, he, who needs test pilots anymore? Uh, well, exactly. All of that stuff. I, I love the idea, especially as the DC in the last year had pivoted to focus on the legacy characters like the Titans and Nightwing and and all those, even Wally, you know, those are all legacy characters. And I and there's a moment where I wrote Hal and Barry talking on top of a rooftop, and they're talking about these kids, quote unquote. And where does that place them as far as heroes? Like the people that they've trained are moving up and now taking on the reins. So what does that mean for them? And I think there is this kind of weird little bit of midlife crisis with Hal trying to figure out who he is is not just. Uh, a Green Lantern, but as a human, as somebody who lives on planet Earth, and uh, because he's been away for so long, how does he reintegrate? And and is it is it worth defending a place that you're never at? You know, was some of the thoughts. Because yeah. you've got Hal Jordan in kind of a, I guess a crisis mode, but also a rebuilding mode. Like I, you got like we've got him living in a trailer, right? So is <laughs> is kind of like uh, you know how do I? I spend so much time away from Earth doing space superhero stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was that the conscious effort to kind of make it more about Hal Jordan the human being as yeah. much, perhaps, if more than Hal Jordan the hero. Yeah, it, it it really was. Part of it was because everybody that when I when I started doing Greenland, everybody's telling me how much they hate Hal. And everybody's like, well, what really? about Kyle? Give me Kyle, you know? And everybody was hating hating Hal. And Jon Stewart obviously was the focal point. Uh, and Joe Moline, I don't know how to say her last name, uh, were the focal point of the last run, Jeff Thorne's run. So Hal hadn't mm -hmm. been the focal point of Green Lantern for a long time. And even when he, he was, I, I was like, oh, man, I really want to investigate really not just him like i'm just a superhero and i have ultimate will but here's a guy that's been gone like how much money does he have in his bank account like this is so, this is so <laughs> pathetic you know and the the girl he loves has moved on and is it okay to pursue somebody that you know that has moved on like some of those questions arise and it's it's the guy that goes off to war and comes back home and um albeit with a little more of a smirk and a, a bit more snark. So it was. It, it's fun to try to figure out what the voice is that I'm trying to write how for. And I'm not getting it perfect, but I, you know, I'll get there. You know, <laughs> so I think you're getting it pretty strong. Okay. I'll say that much. Now there, we 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 talked about a, a little bit about fan opinion in, yeah. in terms of uh, in terms of Green Lantern, and you know, you got this fandom and these characters that have been around for so long, you know, naturally people have opinions about how things should and shouldn't sure. be. Yeah. So in addition to writing the, uh, the Green Lantern main series, you also wrote the night terrors tie-in issue. Right. For, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For Green Lantern. And, and I think it was in the, the deal with Green Lanterns for, for folks who don't know is they have these rings that are fueled by willpower 
and they can construct any physical object that they desire of virtually any size. It's very much in the, an Aladdin and his magic lamp scenario. Yeah. And so in in Night Terror's issue number in Night Terror's Green Lantern issue number two, there's a moment where Hal Jordan uses a big gun against yeah. a, a nightmarish enemy. Yeah. Right. And then moments later, we get a moment where Hal Jordan uses a constructs a regular size gun against right. an enemy. Right. And and I remember looking at that and it it made me turn my head a little bit like, you know, in a in a world where Hal Jordan can create anything. anything. He wants, right. Anything right. 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 How lazy am I? Yeah. No. Listen. No, listen. not not what <laughs> no. I was saying. And, you know, what's so funny is when you say that it's generally that's the biggest task, I feel. And not the biggest task, but it's a huge task. And Green Lantern is trying to what constructs can I do in a way that people have never seen or how can I be creative or whatever? Those two right. instances, which is interesting, because Night Terrors came after my second issue of Green Lantern, and I jumped mm -hmm. right in. It was very and it, early. And it was supposed to be a horror-based based crossover event. And um, and the gimmick is, in the first issue, this creature thinks he's he's pegged Hal Jordan, like, gotten to his fear. But he's Hal Jordan. He doesn't fear anything. And so the second issue is him basically chasing this bad guy down. Mm -hmm. I know the first gun is because I'm a, a a kid that was reading these comics in the you know late 80s 90s. I had written a Liefeld type gun, like you know the okay. Rob Liefeld yeah, oh, yeah. label. You know it's so preposterous. You know it's uh, it's something ridiculous. And I remember seeing that, and I thought that was cool. The other one though was a direct homage to Evil Dead. Because he had a chainsaw, really? he had the shotgun, and it was Evil Dead too, obviously. And I was yeah. like, "Oh, he's killing these zombie things. Let's just go Evil Dead two in it, and and do this cool, you know, movie thing." Obviously, it's one of my favorite movies, so that's probably why I do it. But generally, it's like you know, I have no problem with guns. I'm I'm from Arizona, so it's like a, <laughs> but but in terms of Green Lantern, I I do, and hopefully people have noticed, I do try to go what's the more interesting construct i think in night terrors i i you know obviously the evil dead thing was a top of mind for the other one the other one is like i i honestly i can't tell you how many times i've written in different scripts in animation or whatever like life felt like gun <laughs> really okay oh man man when i was a kid seeing all those pouches and those giant like you know cable would have like this gun that's bigger than like if yeah. this panel it's three-fourths of the panel and i was like that's amazing. <laughs> so the look of a generation say, almost. Well, you know, and that's the thing. I haven't been doing comics that long. And so much of this is kind of wish fulfillment for me where, uh, you know, it's not just being able to do that, but getting able to being able to meet a lot of these people. And we mentioned prior to the show, like Kevin McGuire, that mm. was super informative for me because when I read Justice League International as a kid, I didn't realize comics could be funny. And I had, and and they, Mike Cotton was my editor in, on Flash, and they said, hey, um, we can get Kevin McGuire to do this little Super Friends thing. And I was like, what? I, I mean, I literally was Chris Farley in an elevator, like, <laughs> like freaking out. And then they got him, and they did it. And then I, and then so that was the opening when I went to a convention and I met him. I was like, hey, 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 Mr. McGuire, remember that time that you did the thing? And, and, and then I started pestering him like a, like a, crazed per puppy and i kind of uh you know he's doing the backups three backups in green lantern now and part of that is right. because a i pestered him you know <laughs> and then b i pestered my editor <laughs> and i'm just like yeah, that'd be great you know and and uh you know it's a dream come true i what can you yeah. say it's it's amazing so i mean yeah so you pitched to have because in in one of the great things about the current green lantern ongoing is that we've got backup stories that kind yeah. of explore you know with with some of these different green lanterns beside al jordan yeah and the the current one that we've got going on is it's it's guy's bogus lobo adventure <laughs> yeah that's, that's yeah. what i got okay yeah so, and and yeah the the art it, we've got green lantern guy gardner as our star yeah and like you mentioned kevin mcguire drew justice league international in the late 80s yeah. and one of the characters that he's most synonymous with is Guy Gardner. Yeah. So 
are you you're telling me that you pitched Kevin McGuire for that Guy Gardner story? Hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's my okay. two favorite covers ever. It, uh, I'm not even joking. I've said this for years. Is there's two Justice League International covers, and one is Lobo over Guy Gardner and Guy Gardner having a teardrop, and they had they had made Guy Gardner a pacifist for like a year in the book. I mean, it was yeah, really, really yeah. funny. And because of the boom tube that hit Guy Gardner in the head, at the second cover is Guy Gardner over Lobo with like, I'm back. Yeah. And I adored that because again, it was like a long running gag that I didn't I didn't see coming and it was super fun. And so, so the way I pitched it, it had it, sadly it morphed because of the way that, um, the brainiac tie-in and different things that were happening with lobo and etc but i i i was able to hook them both <laughs> my editor and, both in there. and kevin you know and i'm pretty i'm pretty stubborn not stubborn but persistent when it comes to an idea like i've got several ideas i've pitched and it's like you know i'll have an editor that just kind of goes nah and i'll just be like i'll i'll wait five years i'll wait forever like i'm getting this done <laughs> <laughs> so i mean is it so when you're writing the story, you know you're writing for Kevin McGuire then. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. is, I mean, like you said, you read you read his stuff as a kid. I mean, yeah. it, you mentioned intimidation factor. I mean, does that play does that play a role, or is that just a total thrill no, of a lifetime? No, feeling? no, yeah. It, it, weirdly, not intimidated. It's more like how can you know? And I do this a lot when I'm writing. Is like how can I set up the writers for success or the the artists for success? Yes. Yeah. Like I'm trying to figure out what they enjoy uh, drawing and, and with, with uh, Kevin, I, it's weird to call him Kevin, but uh, <laughs> with him, it's like, I know his facial features and I know that I can lean into physical comedy and I know that I can make something mildly amusing, write something mildly amusing and he'll take it from a five to a 10, like just the way yeah. he does it, it. It's a thousand percent funnier than it is on the page. So I don't, I don't have to try that hard, <laughs> but I try to set up little scenarios. Well, like in the second one, I think today in issue 11, there's like a spit take and it's so funny mm -hmm. to me. It's like such a tropey thing, but the fact that it's Guy and it's it's quote unquote Lobo, it's oh, not really Lobo, funny. but Lobo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really funny. So he, he he can just take everything higher, you know. Excellent. When you know what what's interesting is that in the first part of that story, we had uh, Mr. McGuire draw Omega Bam Man. Yes. <laughs> now this is the this is a very special portion of the interview, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Omega Bam Man portion of the interview. Okay, so Omega Bam Man, and my producer Dimitri is going to put a picture up so we, so people can see what this character looks like. Okay? Right. He looks to me like. A bunch of 80s wrestlers thrown right. into a blender. That's exactly it. Yep. That's exactly okay. Because he made his debut. He made his debut in the Flash. Correct. Back when we had we had uh, Wally West doing like a it was a Galactic Pro Wrestling League. Is that what it was? It was called Wrestlers Across the Multiverse. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay, Galactic Space Wrestlers. <laughs> yeah. So talk to me about the origins of Omega Bam Man. Yeah. <laughs> tell me tell me who and what he is and how he made it into this story with uh, okay. the, drawn by the great Kevin McGuire. Okay, so uh real, real quickly, I I you know, I've been in and out of fandom in, in wrestling in terms of like I grew up in the 80s, so Hulk Hogan, Roddy Piper and all that stuff was obviously a part of my life and every kid's life at that time. Even if it wasn't yeah. like it was aggressive, it was there, you know. Sergeant Slaughter was mm. a Joe for goodness sake. <laughs> and um, then when I moved out to L.A., it was the Attitude Era. And I remember going like, hey, we should go out. And my friends were like, no, uh, Monday Night Raw's on. And I was like, what are you talking about? You guys are watching yeah. wrestling. And then I sit down and I see Stone Cold drive a beer truck into, you know, and spray. I was mm -hmm. like, this is unbelievable, you know. So I would go in and out. And the Venn diagram of, you know, uh, superheroes and wrestlers seem to be a circle because they really mm -hmm. are superheroes in a way. And so... What I was doing on The Flash was I was do like a three or four issue, like serialized arc. And then I would do these one offs that would allow us to jump, like allow readers to jump onto the book if they if they wanted. Yeah. To. And and it just it tickled me, the idea of doing uh, space wrestlers. And um, I had got like right there in on my wall is I got a custom belt made with the Grant Morrison multiverse symbol on it. 
And wow. I thought, oh my gosh, this would be really funny. Make this character that whoever holds the belt has more superpowers. And it all just kind of flowed from there. So much so that when I did it, I was like, oh, why did I give this to DC? I could have done my own book. <laughs> there you go. There but, you go. But in the name Omega Band, man, I was trying to think of a, a cool name. And um, I kept circling around like mythological characters and stuff. And I and I and and it literally is. Uh, I was like, oh, maybe I'll name him Agamemnon. And then I, I kind of like go, no, because the translation microbes would be a little weird. So mm. it'd be sillier. So it was like a Mag Agamemnon, a Mega Bam, a Mega Bam Man kind of like, I was like, it's sort of like that. And it's sort of like cheesy. And because he's this blend of all these 80s characters, it, you know, it's like this fits. And to make him a little more philosophical, and you know, it was, it was just, it was such a, a joy my one of my favorite things in comics right now is like i get to play with other people's toys from the sandbox but or right. the toy box but to add toys back in has been mm -hmm. glorious and so my last couple of issues of flash uh omega Batman gets knocked onto the windshield of mr terrific ship Yes. And, I, and I didn't get to explain how that had happened so i thought oh this will be a fun way to explain uh, because Guy's story is taken, uh, technically is a, a while ago, uh, mm -hmm. to have, this is how how Kriegmeister 10 sucker punches him into the stratosphere as the Wham ship is disappearing. <laughs> so he circled back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it it connects, it connects. I I I definitely, I'm one of those guys that when I see loose threads, I try to tie them up. Yes, uh, all the time even in continuity i try to uh definitely my wally west run was there was a lot of me kind of quote unquote fixing continuity or at least making it make sense and i i have so much joy doing that that was such a fun thing as a kid watching people explain continuity or try to fix continuity um and i love that and, and i mean so get omega bam man i mean he seems like a bunch of wrestlers thrown into a blender i mean i'm looking at him and i'm seeing I'm seeing some Macho Man Randy Savage. Sure. I'm seeing maybe some Magnum TA. I'm seeing some. Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yeah. Are there are there are there are there names I'm missing? Who I mean? Uh, I mean a lot. I mean like e even the way that Fernando drew him. Like I was like, oh, that's kind of a Jake the Snake hair. I mean like you know, there's 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 elements. Fernando Pissarra, the, the yeah. The artist. Yes, yes, Fernando. Fernando and I worked on a ton of stuff. And what was so great is he sent me the original artwork for it um and wow. it's it's one of my pride that he sent me that and like the first appearance of gold beetle and so um having these wacky characters kind of combine and and hang out together but yeah omega band man's one of my favorite and i would love to be able to do more if they get, said hey you want to do a solo wham i'd be like please i'll do that tomorrow there you, go. I will, <laughs> you know say what i jump on tomorrow there you go man <laughs> so and at the risk of bringing him up too much i yeah. mean seeing kevin mcguire draw omega band oh, man, man. Listen, I mean, there's, there's that is part of the deal in my head. I'm like, if I could get Kevin McGuire to draw some character that I co-created, like, oh, <laughs> you know, oh, man, I, I can only I can only imagine what what that must be like. It's just it's, it's amazing. Head explode. Wow. Yeah. So what have we got coming up in uh, in the pages of the Green Lantern? I it, are you are you doing something with Mark Guggenheim? What have we got coming up? So Mark Mark and I have become uh, friends as well, and Mark is doing these backups. Really, so far he's done one that explores uh, Lord Premier Theros, who is becoming a real big character in the Green Lantern series. And it's been really great to have some of the other people that have touched these characters come on at the backup, but also just kind of like show us w what the characters are doing. So as they show mm -hmm. up in the main title, we're not totally uh, blindsided yeah. and kind of catch up to what's yeah, going context. on. So Mark has got some stuff along that vein uh, coming up in the next one. So Green Lantern is moving and grooving. We There's, you know, some absolute power stuff happening this summer in, in D.C. that Hal will be a part of. And then into the fall, we'll have some really big stuff happen in the Green Lantern uh uh, which is which is great and i'm working on something now with phil kennedy johnson that will will uh 
that'll be great. And then I'm also doing Flash Gordon for Mad Cave Studios, which has been uh, fun. The first issue, issue zero came out free comic book day and people have been very kind about that. And I'm working on my own yeah. creator own, which has been something that, again, terrified and also a lot of fun. Tell us about that. Tell us about your creator own project. I can't tell you anything yet, but oh, you can't I'm tell me anything like, yet. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I was going to say, I feel, I, I feel like, like I would have known that, but yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, it's something that I've been threatening. It's something that I, I really do need to do. Uh, okay. And and I've gotten some uh, artwork back on some of like covers that I just is. It's exciting, but it's an expensive um, proposition as a person just doing it. You oh, know? I believe it. And whether or not people like it or not, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm not, I think what people know about me is I like to just write really fun. I'm not trying to change the world, you know, not yet. It's just like super <laughs> there you fun, go. super like you. And once you see the title, you'll go, <laughs> I, I get what this is. This is stupid fun. And that's kind of what I'm aiming for. Well, now I'm, well, now I'm uh, anxiously looking forward to it. <laughs> good, I'm good. Open for coming down the line. All right. Is there anything else you would like to add, sir? Oh my gosh, um, uh, uh, I don't know. The pressure's on. I no, listen. I, I, I feel like I'm in such a wonderful position and a privileged position that I, I've been wanting to do comics my whole life. So, having gone from screenwriting to do comics has been such a joy. I just finished up Jay Garrick. Um, yes. The fact that DC keeps letting me do stuff, and I did a few digital stuff for Marvel which was really fun. And um, I'm really glad, of, I'm really grateful. I mean, fans have been overwhelmingly positive and uh, I don't try to squander that goodwill. I try to be somebody that's, like I said, positive, engage with the with different fans as much as I can and and just try to keep it light and fun and uh, and just do what I, I hopefully can do. <laughs> well, we, we love what you do, Mr. Thank Adams. You. We love Thank it. You. Jeremy Adams, the book is Green Lantern. Issue 11 is on sale now. Sir, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you.